Greetings, friends. As you can see, our subject matter is the historical geography and archaeology of the Holy Land. If we were to step back a bit and look at the stage, if you will, of the world of the Bible, uh, it's all kind of connected, isn't it, to what we would call the Fertile Crescent. Uh, the uh, one tip being in Ur of the Chaldees, Babylon through the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, and follows the rivers and then makes its way through the land of Israel uh, to the land of Egypt. And this is kind of the playing board, isn't it? The stage of the events that take place in the scriptures. The main route, think of it as like a Highway 80. You know, our Highway 80 goes from sea to shining sea and connects New York to California. And uh, we'll think of that international highway we'll talk about a lot uh, throughout this presentation as a Highway 80. The main route going to the main place. There's also intra-regional routes we'll talk about, like the equivalence of 101s, and um, in more regional routes, uh, like a 44 or a 37, then you'll have your footpaths, which are like Star Road. And um, yeah, there we go. Now, uh, as you can see from the map, guys, Israel is the land bridge that connects Africa and Europe and Asia. In the world of the Bible, of course, if you want to get from point A to point B, uh, you either have to walk or ride a beast or go by boat. So all of the ancient superpowers, uh, you have to go through the land of Israel to get from Africa to Europe to Asia and et cetera. And this is seen very nicely in this uh, medieval painting where it shows Jerusalem as the center of the flower and connected to Jerusalem, right, you have Europe and Asia and Africa. Jerusalem's the heartbeat of everything that has happened and everything that has ever happened on planet Earth comes out of Jerusalem almost. And in fact, this is what the prophet says, Ezekiel in chapter five, verse five. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the center of the nations with countries all around her. And we see that represented here. And then we see that also represented here. The idea is from one of the Psalms that there's an umbilical cord coming down from heaven uh, connected to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the, the, you know, from heaven to earth, the lifeline. And it's just not the Jews who believe that about their holy city. The Babylonians also believed that uh, Babylon was connected to heaven uh, with an invisible umbilical cord. It's where the fountainhead, if you will of life. Now what I'd like to do, friends, is um, just from that Fertile Crescent view, just zoom in then on the land of Israel. And what we want to do every night is go over one or two or three or four regions within Israel, and then within each region we'll describe the lay of the land and that whole package, and then we'll look at two or three or four cities that are famous within each particular region. And we'll start with the land of Judah the largest allotment, the largest space of territory given to any of the tribes. When Joshua, of course, came over, uh, you just couldn't move where you wanted to move. You don't have that liberty or that right in that world. You have to move where your tribe lives or where your clan lives or uh, where it's assigned to you. And um, within Judah, of course, we have in 1 Kings 2.11, he, speaking of David, had reigned 40 years over Israel. Israel means something like, um, it's hard to tell, but some people think it means one who wrestles with God or one who struggles with God. Or some people read it as the ish means man, the man of God. Uh, something like that, man of God, the one who wrestles with God and kind of resists and struggles with God. And, uh, but something like that. Anyways, David, uh, seven years in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. And we're going to zero in on, on Hebron first. Hebron means something like alliance, something like alliance. In the world of the Bible, names carry weight and significant meaning. Um, in our world, for example, we just name a child something sometimes because we just like the name, how it sounds, or it was a descendant or something like that, or a relative. But uh, they carry tremendous weight. Gaza, for example, which we'll get to later tonight, means strong, strong. And uh, we'll see why it was called strong. But Hebron means alliance, and that could possibly have something to do with it being David's first capital, where all of the tribes, for the first time after being in the land for 400 years, plus or minus, they finally unified under, under one head, allied under one head in Hebron. Now let's zoom in a little bit. To the east of Hebron, you can see on the map the wilderness of Judah. 
it's perfectly situated as a capital because to the east, you have the Judean wilderness, this tough, rugged terrain, which we'll zoom in more in the days ahead. But it's a region where it only rains a couple inches a year, and you can't bring your chariots and your horses and your armies through here. So Hebron, great place for a capital because to the east, it's defensively fortified. Very nice. And then to the west, as you can see on the, the map here, you have the Shephelah, you can see by the word hill country, which we'll get to later. But the, the Shephelah then to the west, you have these nice open plains, which gives you lots of options, lots of access to the west. You know, they say the west is the best. And it really is in the land of Israel, the west is the best. That's where all the opportunities are, the trade, the commerce, the seaports, and all those kind of goodies. So it gives you lots of options. And uh, Deuteronomy 8, 7, and 8 kind of tells us the foodstuffs of Hebron. Now, Hebron was the, when you think of it in the Bible, think of it as the breadbasket of Israel, the breadbasket. And uh, what did the people in the world of the Bible eat? That's a very good question. Deuteronomy 8, 7, and 8 says the following, uh, for the Lord your God, by the way, whenever you read the word Lord in the Bible, guys, and it's all capital letters, this is Yahweh. The Yod, the He, the Vav, the He, the strong, mosaic, Abrahamic covenant God name. And the, the G-O-D, the common, uh, the Elohim, of course, is plural, right? Let us make man in our image. Let us have dominion, etc. So the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with, and here we go, the seven species. This is what the people in the world of the Bible ate. Wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. You don't eat meat in the world out of the Bible, necessarily. And it's not out of any kind of like a personal conviction or anything, but uh, your bank account, friends, is your sheep and your goats, for the most part. That's the bank account. And let's say you have 50 sheep, and you want to have uh, lamb chops for dinner. Uh, you have just depleted 2% of your entire bank account over one meal. So um, it's only at the high holy feasts, right, Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles, or if a really, really, really special guest comes, right, like in Genesis 18, and Abraham sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and three men stood by him, and he ran out to meet them, and dot, 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 right, and he fetched a calf, tender and good, and hastened to dress it. So this is what they ate, those kind of seven species. And uh, Hebron is, the, like I said, the bread basket for that stuff. For those of you who have a little background maybe in farming, um, the barley harvest is first, it usually takes place in April, and the wheat harvest is second, and usually takes place in end of May or the beginning of June. But back to Hebron for a moment, Genesis 23, 19. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is at Hebron in the land of Canaan. So in the whole land, the whole world of Israel, of course, Abraham didn't own one speck of land. He didn't own anything except that little tiny postage size stamp of a cave. That's all he owned was the cave. Now, here's an artist's rendition of and we'll get to what it looks like today momentarily of what it kind of probably looked like. You know in the Bible it says, and he was buried with his fathers, right? You've read that before. That's a good thing. <laughs> that means that you had an honorable funeral and that your bones were taken and put with your descendants, your forefathers, and you're all buried together in one kind of little mausoleum. If you're buried, if it says he was not buried with his fathers, that means he was a wicked person who was dishonored. And um, so that's probably kind of sort of what it looked like. And they're basing that off of that. That's what Abraham's tomb looks like today in Hebron. And uh, Hebron is a hotbed of hostility. There is only like five or 600 Jews in all of Hebron. And Hebron is the only place, like I previously mentioned, in all of Israel where Abraham actually bought a piece of land. So there's about five or 600 Jews in Hebron and you know, 10 or 20,000 Arabs there. But uh, this, this site uh, that you're seeing now, the architecture is from the, the 15th century and the 16th century AD. And uh, it's the Ottoman period. But uh, originally, uh, it looked like that, 
But there came a point in time about 2,000 years after that that Herod the Great came along. Now, Herod the Great had a lot of problems, and one of his problems was he wasn't a Jew. That's why when the wise men visit him, they say, where is he that was born king of the Jews, which is a dig. It's like, you weren't born king of the Jews. Your father was a Gentile who was forced converted to Judaism by John Hyrcanus in the, that Malachi to Matthew time period. And your mom is from where Indiana Jones part three in the last crusade happened, <laughs> at Petra. His mommy is a Nabataean. So you're, not, you're the farthest thing there is from a Jew. And we're not going to get into that now. But the reason I bring that up is because Herod had that problem where the people weren't accepting him. And so he tries and butters him up. What does he do? He uses the talent on loan that God gave him. He builds. He rebuilds the temple, the holiest site in the whole world. He builds that to pacify them. And he rebuilds the tomb of Herod to make them happy. He tries and connects himself to Abraham, right? Because on Mount Moriah, that's where Abraham offered up Isaac, and that's where the temple was built. And he tries to connect himself to Abraham here because it's Abraham's tomb because Abraham was a Gentile. And you people, you love Abraham as the father of your faith, and he's not a Jew, he's a Gentile. Why don't you love me too? Now, the reason we know that is because the foundations of that building there, if you zoom in a little bit, they're Herodian. Now, some of you can tell a 66 Mustang from a 64 and a half Mustang, because you have the eye. You can see the grill, or an iPhone 5 versus an iPhone 2, <laughs> whatever. So once you get the eye, once you know what you're looking at, you know what time period uh, you're looking at, and that nice beveled Herodian stone. Now, if you walk into that mosque right there, by the way, the two towers on the end of it, those are the minarets, and of course, five times a day, you hear the Islamic calls of prayer, 4.30 in the morning, <laughs> every single day. And um, just pause real quick for a moment uh, as a footnote. Remember Muhammad, who died in 632 AD, his career before he became a, a religious person was he was a semi-truck driver. That's basically what he did. He worked the caravan route. He worked Highway 80. He would go from San Francisco you know, to Sacramento, uh, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, you just name it, East. And when Muhammad would go through these major cities, because Muhammad's living right at the end of the Byzantine period, which is the time the quote-unquote church is ruling the Holy Land. 324 to 640 AD is when the Byzantine church rules the Holy Land. And so he's born right, right at the end of that. And so when he comes out, and out of all these big cities, at the entrance of the city and at the exit of the city and the main route, there would be towers. And on these towers, there was a sect of monks called stylites. And what they would do is, five times a day, these Christian monks would pray aloud to the God of heaven, the God of the Bible. And so Muhammad begs and borrows and steals from the culture and the thought and the practice and the books of the Jews and Christians and puts it all together and makes the Quran and, and Islam. And so that's what those towers are. It's a carryover. From, from that Christian tradition. But if you walk in the front door, you can go in today. You just got to take off your shoes. You just do it right when in Rome. Well, you're not really in Rome, but, you know. And that is the quote-unquote tomb of Abraham, even though it's not. Uh, what's going on here is there's a, a system, a network of caves dug into the Cenomanian limestone under here. And in those caves, which no one can go into today, uh, eventually what you would find is the, the bones of Abraham. So built on top of that cave is the mosque because whoever is uh, the, not the new kid on the block, but the strong kid on the block, right? He's the one who controls the holy sites. And uh, since the Muslims have appropriated Abraham as a prophet into Islam, they control the site, they control the tomb, and you walk in there and you can look through the gate and you look down at just a big black dark hole. But uh, that's, that's it. That is what is recognized as the tomb of Abraham. Now, if we just jump a little north, we're going to go to Bethlehem. Of course, Bethlehem, Beth, when you read the Bible, means house. And Lachem is bread. So the house of bread. And it's kind of neat that the bread of life, Jesus, the bread of life, was born in the house of bread. And when we go to the house of bread, what do we find? After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, we'll pause real quick. Remember we mentioned Highway 80, the international route that goes from Egypt 
through Israel, through Syria, into Iraq, into Babylon. Well, within Israel, the main north-south route is Highway 5. Okay? Highway 5 connects Beersheba to Hebron to Bethlehem, skirts Jerusalem, and goes up to Shechem. That's called the Patriarchal Highway. And it's the main route from Beersheba all the way north to Shechem. So all of those cities, Beersheba, Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem a little off, Bethel, Shechem, they're all on Highway 5. You just got to take the exit, right? And then boom, and you're right there. So Bethlehem's right on the main route going to the main place. Now, that's an aerial shot looking down on the region of Bethlehem. The area of Bethlehem is made of a stone called Senomanian limestone with a C. And uh, Senomanian limestone is fantastic for building blocks, for building your house. Remember in the world of the Bible, you don't build your house with uh, wood and a hammer. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, Jesus is a, is a carpenter in our translations, but the word is tekton in Greek transliterated T-E-K-T-O-N. And a tecton, a better translation, a much better, is a master builder. Not just a hammer and nail kind of guy. I mean, he can make a mosaic floor for you. He can make a door for you, a roof for you, beams, everything. That's what he does. He's a master builder. And so that's looking down on that region where you would get the, the building blocks from. That region is also fantastic for digging pits. You know, when you read the Bible and it says, like, and Joseph's brethren took him and threw him into the pit. Well, it doesn't mean just like a, a hole in the ground, like a pit. It's a man-made dug cistern. Because in the world of the Bible, right, you can't go to Safeway and buy a case of Dasani water. <laughs> okay? What you do is you pitch or you grade your property in such a way where all the rain will go to one spot. And that spot is a hole that you've dug in the ground. And in that hole, then you've pitched it with the equivalent of cement, so the good water stays in and the bad water doesn't come in. And as another footnote, remember when Jesus says, out of me come living waters of life in Jerusalem? He says that, guys, on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. You say, okay, what does that mean? Well, when you put calendar to event, here's what it means. It does not rain in Israel. You can set your watch to it. It's not gonna rain from April, like May, we'll say, till October, November. It will not rain. 99.99% chance in the high hill country, it's not gonna rain. So you have had to have collect all of this rain during the, the, the rainy seasons of November to April to drink and to use every single day. By the way, you don't take a bath, really, in their world either. And um, so when Jesus says, out of me come living waters of life, he's saying it at a time when everyone's cisterns are empty, are just about empty, and you're just drinking that sludge, that scum at the bottom of the cisterns. And so when someone comes along and says something like that, it's really going to grab your attention. And this region was the premier region for digging those pits and, and holding that, that water. Now what you're looking at there is the Church of the Nativity, it was built in about 333 AD by the Roman Emperor Constantine, his mother. His mother's name was Helena. And she came to the Holy Land once her son ruled and reigned. And she was kind of like the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. You know, if you gave her the wrong answer, it was off with your head. So, um, so she came to Bethlehem and they said to her, this is the cave, this is the spot where Jesus was born. And it very well could be. So, but what you're looking at here is... First of all, it was built in 333, but of course it's remodeled by the Crusaders and it's remodeled in the modern era. And uh, let's step inside for a moment. When we step inside, what you're gonna see right away is a mosaic on the wall of the, the three wise men. And um, it's kind of neat that this church, guys, this is the only church in all of the land of Israel that has never ever since the seventh century AD been destroyed by Arabs. The only one. And the reason being, we think, is out of superstition. So when the Arabs would come in and destroy a church or et cetera, of course, you're going to scope it out. You're going to try and find the treasury and you're going right, to find the safe box and all that kind of stuff. And they, they saw this icon on the wall and they said to themselves, this looks like my great, great, great grandpa or something like that. You know, these men from the east and then out of superstition, it's not because of Jesus, it's out of superstition that they never destroyed the church. Now, within the church, just as a side note, what you're looking at there is the tomb, the burial place, the sarcophagus of Jerome, St. Jerome. He's the one who translated the Bible into Latin. 
And that Latin Vulgate text was the, the springboard for, among other texts, the King James Bible. And so he translated the text from the Greek, from the Hebrew into Latin, and he did that inside of the church in about the 4th or 5th century AD, and he's buried in there today. But this is a, a real polished up cave. <laughs> and in this cave, this is according to tradition, that's the spot, according to tradition, where Jesus was born. Now, what's kind of neat is in the world of the Bible, when a child would be born, of course, you can't do an ultrasound back then, but I don't know, maybe moms can tell if it's a boy or a girl. But um, the, 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 the family would hire a band, and the band would wait outside the house. And if it's a boy, they would rejoice, and they'd play music, and they'd sing, and all these kind of things. And at least according to the custom, if it's a girl, not so much. <laughs> not so much. I don't know why. I think I know why, but I'm not going to say and, uh, but um, when the Lord Jesus was born, his parents were poor. And they probably couldn't afford to hire a group, a musical group, to come. So who sings for them instead? The angels. The angels sang instead. And so uh, we have that star there with 14 points. 14 points. Why 14? Why not 13? Why not 15? Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. Thus... There are 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So in other words, from Abraham to David, 14 generations. From David to the carrying away of Babylon, 14 generations. From the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ, 14 generations. Now when Matthew's writing, Matthew chapter 1, guys, he's got 2 Chronicles chapter 3 open. That's what he's looking at. That's his primary source. And Matthew is deliberately omitting names, leaving out names from the Chronicles genealogy to make it, make it 14, 14, and 14. And he deliberately leaves out the names of bad guys. Like uh, Ahab and Jezebel had a daughter, and her name was Italia. And she came down from the north to Jerusalem, did a coup d'etat, took over the temple, and uh, right, slaughtered all the baby boys. Well, she had three sons that are mentioned in Chronicles. Those three sons are not mentioned in Matthew because they are not sons of David, right? And they were illegitimate rulers. But long story short, Matthew does the 14, the 14, and the 14 on purpose to make it a mnemonic, a memory hook, because David's name in Hebrew, the weight of David's name is 14. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, that's four, right? And then the Vav, which is a six, and then another Dalit, which is a 4. So the 4 plus a 6 plus a 4 equals 14. David, the weight of David's name is 14. Everyone in the world of the Bible, their name carried a weight. Like the, the name of like Eleazar, the servant of Abraham. His, the weight of his name is 318. Like, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Okay? So that's why there's 14 points on the star, because Jesus is the son of David. On that day, let's talk a little bit about daily life in Bethlehem. On that day, Jesus is speaking about the end. No one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. So you might say, well, what in the world is someone doing on their housetop with possessions? <laughs> well, remember, in the world of the Bible, their roofs are flat. Not like our roofs, which are like that. Because you don't have, you know, heating and air conditioning like we do. And so in the summertime when it's hot, you go outside and you sleep on the roof, right? Or like David, you look down on the roof and what do you see? You see someone else on the roof, okay? That's what you do, you go up on the roof. And, th and that custom of having the flat roofs Right? has stayed to this very day in the world of the Bible. And so you go to Bethlehem and look at Bethlehem. All the rough houses are flat. It's just what you do in the world of the Bible with your home. Now, one kind of neat thing that the Brits did when the British ruled in Israel from 1917 to 1947, they made a law. And that law was every single house in and or around Jerusalem in regards to uniformity has to either be built of or faced with that whitish Cenomanian limestone, right? It gives it that, doesn't look like a ghetto. And it's, it's kind of a neat kind of rule that the Brits made. Well, just south of Jerusalem, you see, of course, Bethlehem, and then just south, 
Southeast, you see a place called Herodium. Herodium is not mentioned in the Bible, but of course you can guess it's named after Herod the Great. Now Herod had <laughs> these fortresses. You could see Alexandrium, Kypris, that's named after his mommy. And then east of the Jordan River, you see Macarius, that's where John the Baptist was imprisoned. Then you have the famous Masada, right, on the southwest of the Dead Sea. And then Hyrcania, there's buried treasure there, supposedly. And uh, according to Josephus, there is. But it's kind of neat, you have to go there on Shabbat, you have to go there on Saturday, because the, the IDF uses it as a practice uh, battlefield. So go there on Saturday, really early, bring a lot of water and bring Josephus and read Josephus and go, have some fun. And then, of course, the one more, the Herodium. So these fortresses for Herod. Now, that's looking down on the fortress. Now, this fortress is right on the seam of the desert and the sown. Right on the seam of the sown, which is Bethlehem, right? Because that's the capital of the shepherds. And then just east of that is that great and terrible wilderness, that Judean wilderness. Now, you see kind of that peach fuzz look that's going on there? That is as good as it gets for the Judean wilderness. It's enough for the sheep and the goat to nibble on, right? But that's Herod's get out of town, get out of Dodge quick card that he can play when he's in Jerusalem. Now... It, the summit looked like that when it was originally built. Just a fantastic, glorious palace. And in the late 2000s, an uh, Israeli archaeologist, Echud Netzer, was reading Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, who gave the route that was taken on Herod's funeral process from Jericho to here, and he just followed the route, and he looked at where common sense would lead you that he would be buried, and he found his tomb. And so this is the Israeli Antiquity Museum, and they have recreated the tomb of Herod, and then inside it, the sarcophagus. Now, if you zoom in a little bit, the sarcophagus is smashed to pieces. Why would that happen? Well. Remember, right in and around A.D. 70, the Jews were revolting, weren't they, against the Romans. And so this last remnant of these anti-Roman kind of people, they found this site is a good place to hold out, you know, hold out against the Roman government. And when they came here, these anti-Herod guys, these anti-government guys, they found, as the theory goes, they found the tomb of Herod. Now, in the world of the Bible, remember that the body means everything. A proper burial means everything. Uh, even Jezebel, uh, when Jehu came to Je uh, Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her head. She did up her hair because she knows she's going to die probably. And she looks out of the window and he, Jehu says, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. Of course, if you're the bodyguard, the overseer of the queen, you have to be fixed, which they were. So there's two or three eunuchs, right? And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the walls and on the horses, and he trod him underfoot. And then, of course, later it says, uh, all that was left of her was the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. And he, Jehu, said, go, see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she's a king's daughter. So burial, the body means everything. A pharaoh would spend his whole life building a 2.5 million block tomb just to be buried in. In fact, in Deuteronomy 34, when Moses is buried, you know that parallel account in Jude, when it says, yet Michael the archangel, when defending the body of Moses, why would Michael be sent to defend the body of Moses? It says that Satan showed up, and he wanted to destroy the body. Why would Satan want to destroy the body of Moses? Because the body in their thought and process means everything. It's a reflection of what's going to happen to you in the next life. So these anti-government, anti-Herod people, they probably burnt and destroyed his body. And then they smashed the sarcophagus. Sarcophagus is a word which means a flesh eater. And they smashed his sarcophagus to pieces. So may this rubble reflect him in his next life. Well, we'll go to our next region. The Shephelah. The Shephelah, it's a Hebrew word which means lowlands. And it's used, that word lowlands is used 22 times in the Hebrew Bible. 1 Kings 10, 27. And the king, speaking of Solomon, whose name in Hebrew is Shlomo, which is kind of a funny name for the wisest man who ever lived, Shlomo. And so Shlomo, 
made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. And there's a lot of stones in Jerusalem. They're everywhere. Now why was, and we'll talk about Jerusalem later, why did this happen? Because Solomon was able to bend all the traffic to Windsor. Yay! And so everyone in Windsor could have their own vine and fig tree and live life like it ought to be lived. He was able to bend traffic, and since he controlled the routes and controlled the traffic, he, you think a $5 tax is bad there, right? Huge taxes which made the government just glow. It was Jerusalem's golden age, but nevertheless. And he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah. The Shephelah are the lowlands, guys, the lowlands. Now let's look at these lowlands. Now, there we go. <laughs> Think of the land of Israel as a sideway cheeseburger, okay? With four distinct regions that all work together for good, okay? <laughs> You have the top bun is the coast, the Philistine coastal plain, okay? Then the second, the condiments, that's the lowlands, that's the Shephelah, okay? Then the burger, that's the meat of the country, that's the high hill country, that's Judah. And then the bottom bun is the rift, the Judean wilderness in the Dead Sea. Now this is what the Shephelah looks like. It's about 660 feet above sea level, it's generally speaking made of this Eocene limestone, this really chalky limestone that's really not good for building and it's not good for digging pits and it's just, but what it is good for is, ooh, look at that, raising crops. Now, remember, the main routes in the Shefela would be not only on the ridges, but that's looking down on those valleys. So the valleys function not only as, uh, remember we mentioned Highway 5? that went through the center of the country. We call that the watershed ridge. So all the water that hits that ridge would either drain down to the Dead Sea or it drains down to the Mediterranean Sea. And then during the rainy season, those wadis, wadi is an Arabic word, in Hebrew it's nahal, think of them as, as uh, modern uh, 21st century drains, right? The, the water drains. And so the, it would, the water would drain in there and that's the route you would take to get from point A to point B. Now, one of the cities we want to look at here is Lachish. So the North Pole of the lowlands is not Gezer, but Gezer. Gezer. And then the South Pole of the lowlands, the Shefela, is Lachish. So this region, as you can see Jerusalem right there in the high hill country, right? And then you have Ashdod and Ashkelon on the coast. It's caught between it. So this region functioned like a ping pong ball. It just went back and forth, back and forth between the powers of the day. When we think of the world of the Bible and the, and the geopolitical world of it, you want to think of it in terms of cats and mice. Cats and mice. The cats are Babylon, Rome, Assyria, etc. And then the mice are anyone who ends in an ite. Okay? <laughs> Edomite, Moabite, Hittite, Israelite. They're all mice. And uh, that region of the lowlands, it's going back and forth between the mice. Now, uh, just like today, uh, for example, in California, right? On the coast and the lowlands in this area right here, and as you move your way west, it's more often not affluent compared to the high hill country up in Redding, we'll say. <laughs> Okay? It's just how it is. And, it, and it's the same in the worlds of the Bible. Up in the high hill country, 2,500 feet above sea level where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are, it's conservative. You know? It's tight knit. It's slow paced. Uh, ideas, uh, ec economic opportunities. It takes a while to reach its way from the coast all the way up to 2,500 2, feet above sea level. Whereas the plain right there, right, it's more liberal, it's open-minded, it's kind of anything goes, and there's more opportunity. And the Shefela is caught right, right between the middle. So the Shefela, it functions like saloon doors. The Israelites are always trying to come down and bust through the saloon doors for economic opportunity on the coast, and the Philistines are trying to do the same thing. The Philistines are trying to bust up east to grab a hold and control Judah. 
So like I said, the city we want to look at is that one on the bottom, the South Pole, is Lachish. You're not going to read a lot about it in the Bible. You'll read some about it. But Lachish is like the second most important city in all of Judah. Reason being, it functioned like as the southwest offensive line to protect the quarterback of Jerusalem. So any attack coming from the south, any attack coming from Egypt, any attack coming from the Philistines, etc., Lachish would bear the brunt? Is that the right word? Yes, the brunt of the blow. So that is what in Hebrew is called a tel, T-E-L. And it's a word in Hebrew that means old, old. And by the way, uh, the word aviv uh, means springtime or new. So the capital, Tel Aviv, that's, it means old new. And uh, that fits nicely when you go there because you're standing on a site that's 3,000 years old, but then you walk down and you can buy a Red Bull. It's just old and new are like right next to each other. <laughs> At least I would buy two or three of them. Yes. Okay, so there's like 20,000 or something like that, guys, of these man-made towels all over Israel. And um, a towel, think of it like a birthday cake. I was going to buy a birthday cake today, but I didn't to show it to you. But you take a cake, and you cut it open, and you look inside it, and what do you have? You have very distinct layers. And that's how these mounds are. Just layer after layer after layer after layer of civilization from in the beginning, and then from the time of Alexander the Great and 333 and the Romans after him, we know that people, generally speaking, move from the top of the towel down to ground level. Because now there's police. Now the roads are lit. Now there's opportunities. Now, now it's safe. It's Pax Romana. And the reason you can tell what layer of civilization you're in when you cut open one of these towels is the pottery. The pottery is the key that unlocks the dating of what layer of time. Okay, I mean, whatever I find in this level is from David. You know, whatever I find in here is from Jeremiah. Whatever I find in here is from Malachi. You get that. You get the idea. So this city in its heyday, there's an artist rendition, looks something like that. I mean, this is a big, bad hub of administration and religion and politics and power. Whenever you read Lachish, think of it in those terms. Now, Sennacherib, while King Sennacherib of Assyria, so he's a cat, and this is about 701 BC, was still besieging the town of Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah and all the people in the city. Now, we know from extra biblical sources that Sennacherib gobbled up 46 cities in Judah. And then after he gobbled up those 46 cities in Judah, he made his way towards Jerusalem. Now we know though, of course, that 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were killed in one night. That's the only account in all of the Old Testament told by three different authors. It was so important to the national identity of the Israelites that it was repeated three times. So it says right here that Sennacherib besieged Lachish. It says it in the Bible. So it must be true. Well, archaeologists come to Lachish and what do they find? In the world of the Bible, there's a few different ways that you can conquer or take a city. You can, uh, you can set it on fire. Like Jericho was set on fire. The, the, the word there is shoach, a shoach, which means whole burnt offering, which is the word for holocaust. That's what holocaust means, a whole burnt offering. So you take the whole animal, that whole Angus cow that's worth a lot of money, and you put it on the altar, and you put your hand on its head, kind of transferring your sins, if you will, and you take out the knife, and you slit it open, and you drain out all the blood, and then you just take that whole beast, and you just offer the whole thing as a whole burnt offering to Yahweh. You can destroy a city by fire. Another way to destroy a city is by water, if it's next to a river, like Nineveh was in the book of Nahum in chapter 2. Another way to take a city, which is the least favorable way, is a siege. The Egyptian pharaoh Tutmos III uh, had Megiddo surrounded for, I think, like 90 days or something or more, and he just had to wait and just wait and wait till the people inside starve or turn on themselves. When Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem from 605 all the way to 586, it was like a year and a half siege. It was so bad, of course, that according to Lamentations 4, the women were cooking and eating their children. It was so bad. 
Another way to take a city is to dig a tunnel underneath. And that's the way David did it in 2 Samuel chapter 5 when he took Jerusalem. And one more way to take it is to build a ramp. So what you're looking at is the following. I don't have a laser pointer, but you can kind of see a seam there. And this side of it is a ramp, and then that side of it is the towel. So what probably happened is Sennacherib's marching through Judah, gobbling up all these little unwalled villages and etc. And he's taking the men, prisoners of war, and of course he's not going to use his own soldiers to build the ramp because the Israelites up on top are just going to pick them off, aren't they? With bow and arrow. So he probably uses the capture, their cousins right, to build a siege ramp. And that's how they took the city. This is the only Assyrian siege ramp that is left in the whole wide world. So when archaeologists come to Nineveh about 100 or 130 years ago, they find Sennacherib's palace. And in his palace, they found a relief about 90 feet long, which were snapshots of the greatest moments of his career. And one of those snapshots was Lachish, Sennacherib, a siege ramp, and taking the city. Just like the Bible says. Over 50 guys, five, zero, 50 names mentioned in the Old Testament, archaeologists have found their name in the earth on an object. And over 30 names from the New Testament, they found their name on an object in the earth. Every time they find something, friends, it correlates very, very nicely with the text. And this will be our last region of the night, the Philistine coastal plain. The Philistine coastal plain. The coastal plain has Jaffa as the North Pole and Gaza as the South Pole. And it's about 15, 20 miles long, something like that. And uh, of course, this is the hub, the, the ground zero for the Philistines. By the way, that's what a Philistine looked like. We often wonder, what in the world did these people, what was their caricature, their profile, you know, their bone structure? And we know from the Egyptian reliefs built by Ramses II of what the Philistines looked like in their headdress. And there you go. So when you read the text and you read about Philistines, right, think of them right, looking like that. Joshua 10.41, speaking of the South Pole, Gaza, of the Philistine coastal plain, and Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza. Joshua could not take Gaza. The reason Joshua could not take Gaza, well, it's not given. But Gaza means strong. So strong, so bad that Joshua can't even take it. So strong, so bad, David can't take it. So strong that the only way Solomon could take it was he received it, right, through intermarrying. You know, it says Solomon had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. That's a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything else. I'll just leave it right there. So when he's making all these political marriages and right, having all these geopolitical connections happen, he, the women that come to Jerusalem, they just don't come by themselves. They bring an embassy to Jerusalem. And they would set up cultic shrines to their own deities and worship their own gods there. And just like uh, Naaman in 2 Kings 5, right, he wants to bring earth from his own homeland. That's what these princesses would do. They would physically bring earth from Windsor and transport it up to Reading, the capital, right, and put the earth as the floor inside of their palace. Because now you could pray to your own deity on your own home turf. And so... That is part and parcel of the reason why Jerusalem became so idolatrous is because all these princesses are bringing in all of their false deities. But Gaza. Now, we don't have time to go into the issues of the Gaza Strip today. Oh, it's just a hornet's nest of terrorism. Maybe that's a different seminar. But um, here's a shot from the 1800s, early 1900s. Remember I talked about pottery dating? Well, the guy who cracked the code on pottery dating. His name is William Matthew Flinders Petrie. And he was an odd duck. He was a, he's a Christian and uh, he worked in Egypt a lot. And uh, he's the first person, the first Westerner ever to measure the Great Pyramid. Because the Muslims would not let anyone measure the Great Pyramid because that's forbidden. So what he did is he pretended he was Mashugana. He pretended he was crazy. And he put on a pink ballerina dress. And he, and he just, you know, three feet at a time, paced himself, 
And he was the first one by doing that, right, to, uh, to measure the Great Pyramid. But whatever, he did it. <laughs> but uh, I probably would do the same thing. I think I would. But, uh, but Petrie came to Gaza, and he's like, I can't dig here. I can't do any archaeology here because the inundation, the, the sea salt, the waves, the wind has just ruined everything. And not only that, it's totally occupied. Just like in Hebron, not much archaeology has ever been done in Hebron because of the continual occupancy. You can't be like, you, everyone just needs to leave because <laughs> I need to dig a hole in the ground with a back hole. I mean, you know, that doesn't fly. And if you look at it today, you know, you can't do any archaeology there. It's just a hornet's nest of terrorism and just, it's just continual occupancy. But when you read the Bible and you think of Gaza, think of it as San Francisco, kind of. Um, it's the port city par excellence in the worlds of the Bible. Now, the great spice route, the caravan route, it starts in the region of the Persian Gulf and it goes 1,492 miles and this is where um, you would bring your gold and your myrrh and your frankincense and your cinnamon and all your spices and you bring that and on the way you trade it and etc. There's 66 stops on that 1,492 mile road where they'd have caravans and trading and you'd bazaars and all these kind of things and then once you got to Gaza you would take all those goodies, those top shelf goodies, and then you'd, they'd be exported to the whole eastern and all of the Mediterranean seaboard. So Gaza is, if you can control Gaza, which Egypt is always trying to reach up and grab and hold onto Gaza, if you can control Gaza, then you own all of the Macy's in the world or all of the top shelf kind of items, the Tiffany's, right? You control all of that. So there's a tremendous, tremendous benefit to being able to control Gaza. Now, just north of Gaza, 13 miles, is Ashkelon. Ashkelon's a Hebrew word that means something like to weigh, to weigh, which signifies probably its significance in commerce. Now, Gaza is located right smack dab on Highway 80, but also on the international, the east-west spice route. We'll call it, uh, I don't know, 101, okay? It's just a perfect location. But Ashkelon is just a stride, just off Highway 80, so it's gonna be a little less, you know, uh, lower rent, right, than it would be in Gaza. So, speaking of Ashkelon, what you're looking at here is the first time Ashkelon's ever mentioned in an archeological object. Um, this is, um, as you can see, it's a clay object that was made to look like a doll. It's an incantation object. And what would happen is before the pharaoh would go out to war, his magi, his wise men would come in and they'd have bowls and these little dolls and they would write on these bowls and these little dolls spells in all of the cities that the pharaoh was hoping to conquer on the expedition. And they would take these objects and smash them at the feet of pharaoh and may your enemies be destroyed like these objects are destroyed. And they found it, one of these incantations, and they put it back together, and Ashkelon's name uh, was mentioned on one of these. Not only that, that good-looking guy, I hope you look that good if you are, um, let's see, 3,200 years old. Yes, uh, this guy's name is Merenepta, Merenepta. And he's kind of a, a minor pharaoh, but he's important because inside of his tomb, which we see here in the Valley of the Kings, you can go there today, it's pretty fun. And when you go into his tomb, there was a relief. And on that relief, it shows Merenepta conquering and taking Ashkelon. Not only that, what you're looking at there is called the stele or a stella, about the shape and size of the big tombstone. It's called the Merenepta stella. And if you zoom in on the bottom, there's a row there. We'll zoom in there. It has the first time ever that not only is Ashkelon mentioned and Gaza mentioned, but this is the first time ever outside the Bible that Israel is ever mentioned. And it's from 1200 BC. So we know for sure, now Israel is laid waste, his seed is no more. This is all propaganda, right? He's just, he's lying. But, um, but it shows you that in 1200, Israel had a strong presence in the land of Canaan, which fits nicely, right, with our dating of the Exodus. Now, Judges 14.9, speaking of Ashkelon, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, Samson, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them. So when Samson came down to Ashkelon, he would have walked through that gate. 
All you got to do is you just use your sanctified imagination a little bit. You clean it up, you fix up the bricks, and boom, that's the gate Samson walked through. Now, right before you walk through that gate, there's a little bit of a, of a hill there. And on that hill, they found a temple to Baal. And so the archaeologists come and they find, among other things, that. <laughs> that is a household deity that's the animalistic representation of what Baal looked like. So you hear all the railing on Baal worship, right? Baal could be in a human form. Whenever Baal's in a human form, he's just like the Pharaoh. The left foot of the statue is always in front of the right foot, which is a theological statement. They're walking into eternity, but it's also a position of strength. It's, you know, right? And Pharaohs and the images of Baal almost always are in the smiting position. Pharaoh was striking his enemy in the head. And the Baal is throwing lightning because Baal is the god of rain. And Baal's symbol, if he had a, an icon, it'd be a lightning bolt. Sorry, Charger fans. Yeah. A lightning bolt, which is kind of weird because when, uh, when Elijah asks Yahweh to answer him on Mount Carmel with a sign from heaven, what does God do? God sends fire, but what that means is lightning. So God answers Elijah in the form of Baal when Elijah is at war with the prophets of Baal. And so Elijah just goes off the deep end. He, he Seriously, he does. He wants to commit suicide. He just goes south. And he's like, I'm done. And he goes down to Mount Sinai and he just wants to die. It is better for me to die than to live. He's just so done with it. So, Baal. You'd have that in your house. Well, I hope not you, but... <laughs> You'd have that in your house, and that's, that's who you pray to for rain, right? There's Baal. By the way, just as a footnote, Ashkelon has the largest doggy graveyard in the whole world of the Bible. <laughs> Archaeologists found like over 600 dogs buried there. So during that Greco-Roman period, there was some kind of cultic doggy, <laughs> doggy worship at Ashkelon. Now, speaking of Ashkelon, if you jump over the Jordan River, which we'll get to later, you're going to get to a town called Medaba and Moab. And in this church, which was built in the Byzantine period, which is 324 to 640 AD. Anyways, I don't know, 100 or 200 years ago, the monks come and they want to redo the floor, right? So they rip up the quote unquote carpeting and they pull up the floors. And what do they find? They find mosaics, because remember in the world of the Bible, your house is just going to be dust unless you put like straw down or something right, to keep it down. But if you've got a little money and you want to make it look nice, you do these mosaics, right? just these little pieces of rock. Right? And you can make geometric designs and all these things, and depending on how much money you want to spend, right? it gives the room some warmth. It just ties the room together. Anyways, <laughs> that was a reference to the Big Lebowski, if anyone was listening. OK, so the monks come. They rip up the floor, and they find on the ground the oldest map ever discovered of the Holy Land. And if you zoom in on it there, it's from 600 AD. It's 1,400 years old. You can see the Jordan River there, right? You can see Jerusalem. Well, at least I can. Uh, you can see Jerusalem there. And on that is also mentioned Ashkelon. Pretty neat. And then our last city is Jaffa. Jaffa is a Phoenician word, which means beautiful. Yafo. And it, and it really is beautiful. Remember, this is the port city for Judah, right? You want to bring timbers down and build the temple in Jerusalem? Okay, you got to log them down, you cut them down in Tyre, you bring them down to Tyre or Sidon, you wrap them together and you, you uh, tow them on a boat and you bring them down to Jaffa. Then from Jaffa, you bring them 40 miles up and 2,500 feet up to the high hill country of Jerusalem. But you bring them to that port. Right? Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Jaffa. That's where Jonah went. Now, just as a note, see that church right there? Okay. This is where I went on my first date with Sarah. It was a group date, you know, so <laughs> there's no pressure. And uh, I'm like, well, do you want to stay behind and just hang out? And she's like, sure. So we're hanging out, and um, God bless those Filipinos. They, uh, they rent that church from Catholics on Saturday night. It's a Catholic church. And the church is built on top of the house of where Peter had his vision, right? When he saw the sheet come down from heaven. By the way, that word for sheet is the same word for sail. 
And he's looking at all the seals anyways because he's looking out on the ocean. And also, by the way, in the world of the Bible, you always take a nap after lunch. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. You always take a siesta. And uh, anyways, in that church, which we had our first date on, the Filipinos, when you pray, you hold hands. So the first time I ever held Sarah's hand was in Peter's house. <laughs> so whatever. The girls will enjoy that story when they're older, right? OK, now, speaking of Jaffa and going back to Egypt, if we're in Karnak or Luxor or the Greek, which is Thebes, there's this relief on the wall by Thutmose III, who in 1550 AD came up from Egypt, went on Highway 80, ripped up, tore his way through the land of Israel, and worked his way north. And then after the campaign, he made this list of all of these conquered cities that he conquered. So what he did is he has a, a, a representation of a Semitic person's profile. They're a prisoner of war. Their arms are tied behind the back. And there's a cartouche on their chest that has the names of the cities that he took. And one of those cities is, is Jaffa. Archaeologists also found these gates at Jaffa from the time of Thutmose III. And it's kind of neat. What do the Egyptians do to the doorposts of their house? The Egyptians write spells to Amun-Ra and Anubis and whoever on the door frame of their house, just like the Israelites write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So remember, the Israelites are living in Egypt for either 215 years or 430 years. The King James says, now the sojourning of the children of Israel in Egypt was 430 years. But the Septuagint? Jesus' Bible, right, says the sojourning of the children of Israel was 215 years in Israel and 215 years in Egypt, which gets 430. So there's a variant in the reading there. So the Israelites were either in Israel 430 years or 215 years, whatever. But the point being is the customs, the mannerisms of the Egyptians... Right? The Israelites had those appropriated into their life and into their worship. When they live there, this is, what, this is what you do. You write on the doorpost of your house. So God says, well, you do it too, right? But just do it for the right reason. It's kind of neat, uh, right? You know, when Charlton Heston comes down from the mount, right? He has these two tablets of stone like this, and he smashes them. And uh, it was... Uh, in the world of the Bible, every single tablet that's ever been found in Egypt is the size of the palm of your hand. That's it. And the custom of the Egyptians was to take the law of their God and to lay it at the feet of the statue of their God. That's what you do. So what do the Israelites do? They take the law of God, Ten Commandments are probably just that big, right? And they lay it in the Ark of the Covenant, right? And then the top of the Ark of the Covenant is called what? The mercy seat or the footstool. The footstool of who? The invisible Yahweh that stands on top of it. Same kind of thing, just appropriating the customs. Well, we're going to finish up here. I am, want to get you done on time. That good-looking guy is uh, Tutmos III, we mentioned. Now, speaking of the Philistines, of course, we want to mention Samson. Now, this was what I'm about to show you. was not found in Jaffa, but it's real close to Jaffa at a place called Tel Kassile, right there. And it's based on Judges 16.9. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. So the idea is, is um, it's, that's, a, I think, an inappropriate, not inappropriate, an, a not correct <laughs> representation. The verse doesn't mean he took the pillars and did that. OK? I'm sorry, that is correct. He's pushing on it. He's going back and forth. That's what the idea of being painted in Judges is. He's doing that, not that. OK? So what do archaeologists do? They come to Tal Kassile, and they find a Philistine temple. Now, this was not the temple that Samson knocked down. But what's kind of neat is that the whole temple, and I'm sure that they are modeled after the same pattern. They're very similar in their blueprints, the temples. And so they find two pillars holding up the whole building, and they're just enough distance apart, right, where you can do that, and then you can do that, and bring the house down. That's it, guys. We are finished for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.